Hey, I'm Christopher John Farley, a senior editor with The Wall Street Journal. Today, my guest is Mike Coulter. He's the star of Netflix, Luke Cage, which began streaming today. Thanks for coming to The Wall Street Journal. Thanks for having me. Luke Cage is based on a comic book that came out in the 70s. And I remember the 70s. I think I had the Shiki then. Uh, I had the uh -huh. pick with a pick with a fist at the end of it. I mean, <laughs> what makes the 70s relevant today? What makes this comic still relevant to the 21st century? Oh, well, the 70s was a sweet spot. I mean, it's post-civil rights. I think people were kind of discovering themselves anew in a different society that's kind of been... Uh, changed in, in, a, in a major way and when you're trying to explore things in a society when you have new rules new opportunities here you have this uh this black guy who's uh basically a superhero under the under those same rules of same that same new world and he's kind of discovering who he is i mean there's an era of black exploitation as we know and, and people talk about that word they toss it around and i think they misunderstand that it's really it's not like you know it's a show where black people are making fun of certain things they're just doing everything that the white leads would do but they're black i mean it's not like we're making fun of of being black what it is is to be the lead to get the girl to be suave cool and to look good kicking butt i mean it's, it's pretty it's pretty straightforward um so that era resonates now because you know even here we are 40 something years later we're still kind of defining who we are in society and i think it still holds true to uh, to a certain extent now of course netflix is building up this whole stable of marvel superheroes there's daredevil there's jessica jones for people that don't know who weren't who didn't have read the comic book and haven't streamed all the episodes which are available right now tell me what's luke cage about Luke Cage is a standalone series if you haven't seen jessica jones it's okay we encourage you to watch it but if you start watching luke Cage, you don't have to know anything backstory about the his powers or anything of that nature. We'll catch you up on it. We start out with a wrongly convicted man who was sent to prison, who was illegally experimented on. He escaped. He uses powers to escape, and now he's in society trying to figure out what to do with himself. He has an alias. It's Luke Cage. His real name is Carl Lucas. Um, we'll get to how that happened and why he changed his name. But there's a lot of backstory. What you'll find is he's in Harlem, hiding out. It's kind of like a hip-hop western of sorts. The no-name guy or the unknown man, man comes to town. There's an established um, bad guy. The people listen to him because that's kind of been established and they don't know who else to turn to. This guy comes into town, doesn't want any parts of it, wants to mind his own business, just wants to be left alone. And eventually people find out about his abilities. He tries to stay out of the fray, but um, he gets caught up, and eventually there's a showdown. And everyone likes that classic structure, the bad guy, the villain, the good guy, and the people who are in the town trying to figure out where they will fall after all, this, the, all the smoke clears. Um, Luke Cage is a very relatable story. The guy's trying to make ends meet. He's trying to provide for himself, pay his rent, find love, romance. And he's kind of, um, you know, he's a blue-collar guy. You know, he's sweeping floors, he's washing dishes. He's got more that he wants to do. He's very, very progressive and very ambitious but he just hasn't found his groove yet so it's I think it's something people can relate to in terms of his powers he has super strength he has um, invulnerable skin it can't be pierced by bullets mm -hmm. when I whenever I hear about people power powers like that I wonder how does he shave exactly I mean, how does he do some of the ordinary things that people have to do to sort of maintain themselves well, that's a good question see it's just like you know it's just like how I would shave because because you can use a trimmer that yeah. doesn't actually have to break the skin or scrape the skin it just okay. cuts the hair off the top of it so he just cuts it really close but it doesn't actually you know doesn't actually break the skin. Okay, so so he, but he doesn't nick himself, so he doesn't. He never nicks himself. And that'll be all in the DVD, probably. Explain yeah, yeah. How, how, to, how, Luke Cage. how to shave if you're Luke Cage, <laughs> if you have my powers. And of course, you know the other shows um, that are related to this show, like Daredevil that I mentioned, like Jessica Jones, like Iron Fist, which is coming out soon mm -hmm. on Netflix, and like The Defenders as well. Um, where it's going to be a whole team of some of these Netflix superheroes. You're going to start filming that in a few weeks. How's that going? It's coming up very shortly. Um, doing press for this right now, just uh, trying to launch this and show this to the world. Uh, they're working hard to make sure all the stories are in place and that they have the, the structure and that then we'll start filming. It's going to be, a, you know, obviously a collaboration of all the major superheroes from their own series. They did a really cool thing at Netflix and Marvel. They decided to tell each individual superhero story first so you could actually get to know that superhero on an individual basis and connect with them and then see them connect together and try to work as a team. I like that because 
when you see them connect as a team, you already invested, if you've seen all four, you've already invested in them as individuals, so it makes the story more rich. When you're trying to tell the story in the reverse, and you're telling them as uh, this is the group of superheroes, and you're trying to figure out who each one of the superheroes are, how they kind of relate to each other, you're not really getting, de getting detailed um, information, you're not connecting to each one of them, so it's very difficult to, to connect to the story. So I think this is a good platform to do this on, and I think we're, they're doing a great job at it. There's another connection with another group of superheroes, the Avengers. Throughout Luke Cage, we hear, hear references to the event, to a big battle that took place in the Avengers film series. Any chance that Luke Cage might somehow pop up in, in the actual Marvel movies on the big screen, or that you might connect more fully with that group of superheroes? Well, that's the Marvel, that's the wonderful thing about the Marvel Universe. I mean, the Marvel Cinematic Universe, the Marvel Television Universe. It, we're all in the same place, you know, most of it happens in New York City. New York City is a small yet large city, so everyone can kind of have their own space, but at the same time, <clears throat> they can reach each other. It's not like, you know, there's, you know, there's Captain America and there's, you know, Iron Man in this tower. There's, there's phones. I mean, if there, there's ever a need and they can, they need to reach out, you know, we, we've discovered from, um, I think it was uh, Civil War, the film, that it, it, you, know, you never know when you're going to bump into another gifted individual and you become allies. So I think the possibility is there. I think scheduling is a big um, issue. I think Jeff Loeb um, uh, commented about that earlier at some point during Comic-Con, talking about the scheduling, how this works. Um, things are, plans are made so far in advance. We're doing a television series that shoots six months out of the year, and then we, you know, each one of them takes them their own time. So planning is of the essence. So while I would love to have this happen, it, it would be very difficult, but never say never. So the possibility is out there at some point the Defenders and the Avengers might someday meet. You never know, yeah. <laughs> now, you also mentioned the fact that, you know, the, the sense of place. Place is very important because your show is set in Harlem. What I find fascinating about it, it really sort of imbues Harlem with the kind of magic you can sort of imagine all these sort of superheroes walking around and doing things. How important was it for you to actually film there and really um, give the show a sense of place? Uh, it was really uh, instrumental and I, I'm not sure exactly what uh, what brought it to Harlem. I think it was a it was an idea by one of the producers. Chael was completely on board with it. Um, the story <clears throat> being told in Harlem gives Luke Cage a chance to kind of become a legend in his own right. When you think about Harlem, you think about the richness of the culture, the music, the politics, the, the great individuals that have come from Harlem or have spent time in Harlem who are, or, or who are relatable via Harlem. When you, when you think about, you know, the Cab Calloways and the Duke Ellingtons and, and Miles Davis, you think about all the, you know, you know, the Frederick Douglass and the Adam Claytons, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, these great individuals all were in Harlem at some point or, 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 or affiliated with Harlem at some point in some way. So for Luke Cage, it's just kind of, it makes sense. It's, you know, it's appropriate that this character kind of dwell in this, in this place. The only difference is he has superpowers and super abilities, but we all look at these individuals that I just named as somewhat superheroes because they were able to do something that was other, otherworldly, and um, we kind of look up to them in, in that way. So he, he's, he's fits, he fits right in. Now, of course, you know, it is a fun show, it's a superhero show, but there's some serious underlying themes there. I've heard the creator of the show talk about the fact that he, um, that the world is ready for a bulletproof black man, and, mm -hmm. and in the show, your character wears a hoodie. Uh, do you think it um, somehow, does any of that speak to sort of some of what's in the papers today about, you know, police brutality and mm -hmm. issues of, um, of, of unfairness that the police may be shown to, towards African Americans? Do you think the show speaks to that in any kind of way? Sure. I think everyone is going to draw their own conclusions from the show. They're going to look at this, uh, the optics of it, the hoodie, the bullets bouncing off this, this man who happens to be black in this time that we're in, and they're going to make assumptions. And, and we understand that there's a certain symbolism there that we embrace and that we, we you know, are completely aware of. Uh, at the same time, we're trying to, in, trying to entertain people, and, and, uh, and all in all, it is a Marvel show with no agenda of sorts. But you can't help that the times that we're in are kind of defining how people will watch this show. Um, I, I think Luke Cage is definitely something that will make people think. Um, it's not something that speaks against police, um, the police force as a whole. Um, but it does speak to morality. It does speak to doing what's right. And it speaks to reform and not suffering, um, not, not settling for anything less. Um, there's a lot of excuses made by about why things are the way they are, but little is being done to change them. I think what 
Luke Cage is good about is what is good about Luke Cage is that he inspires people to do things that seem difficult, but still, if you put your your, your you know your your effort in and you really stick to it, it can be done. You know, it, it, there are no excuses. So I think Luke Cage will continue the conversation. I hope will make people open their eyes. Yeah, I want to talk a little more about that hoodie too, because <clears throat> in the comic book, people are, may, may remember, you know, uh, Luke Cage has his tiara, yeah. he has his gold shirt, mm -hmm. he's got this big belt. You're not rocking any of that stuff here, uh, except for one scene. We kind of make a reference to sort of yeah. a homage to that. Uh -huh. Homage to that. Yeah. Uh, tell me a bit about the the fashion choices you made for the show. Were you in on deciding what the character should wear? Yeah, sure. I think the first discussion we had, Cheo and I, we talked about use of the N word. We talked about hoodies. We talked about music, and we talked about you know just the tone of the show overall. And the hoodie came up because you know it made sense. It was more appropriate for the time. You have my word, ma'am. I've got you. It made sense because it actually is it is an effective disguise in a, in, a, in a way without trying to be overtly, you know, you know, um, drawing attention to yourself. You know, a tiara is not a good disguise, you think? It draws a little too much attention, yeah, yeah. you know. We want to be um, somewhat, you know, somewhat hidden yet not call attention to it. The hoodie is easy. You put it down, you put it up. And at the same time, it's something that's very comfortable and practical. People wear it all the time. You know, the fact that it's been associated with uh, the Black Lives Matter is because of Trayvon Martin, because of the, the senseless, um, you know, reasoning behind pointing out black males who wear this as if they're wearing it to rob banks every time they're putting it on. It just, it's, it's, it's unbelievable that they can't wear the hoodie for what it's actually, you know, worn for, which is just to be comfortable. Um, it's a sad state of affairs. I remember growing up in, uh, in South Carolina years ago, and I didn't wear it because my mother and I talked about it, and it was something that was, I was conscious of. Um, after the Trayvon Martin incident, I really, uh, it, it angered me, and I, and I thought to myself, I said, this is really ridiculous that I have to consciously think about this kind of stuff and for me it was sort of a stance and I went out and bought several hoodies so I felt like this show was a chance to you know bring attention to that and just kind of make sure that people knew that sometimes heroes can wear hoodies as well and of course people may remember you also from the good wife where, um, where you played a very memorable gangster character who sort of it was a family man mm -hmm. but had all these other sort of underworld dealings going yeah. on the good wife sort of wrapped up its run may have a spin-off any chances of us seeing you in that role at any point in the near future? Any more Good Wife episodes left in you in terms of spin-offs from well, that show? Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm in New York. Um, if the schedule permits, you know, Robert and, and uh, Michelle King, they know where to find me. Um, I, we, we all film in Brooklyn, so it's, it's, it's not impossible. But, you know, I, I have a full schedule. I mean, in, in certain ways, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know that it makes sense. Um, I don't know what their storyline is, but, you know, Lamont Bishop is... Uh, He's, he's around, so, so it would be nice to reprise him if, if they wanted me to. And, and back to Luke Cage, one thing I really found fascinating about the show is how much music is a part of the show. I mean, from images of Biggie Smalls yeah. that pop up to Cotton Mouse Club where he has rappers and R&B singers and uh, the whole sort of range of uh, performers on the stage. How important uh, in your mind was music to sort of setting the tone for the show? It was very key. I think when Chael talked about Wu Tang Clan, you know, my ears perked up, and I was like, "I'm, I'm in," because because what what he was basically saying was that he wanted to use a timeless sort of sound that, while it was dated, it never really lost its you know its appeal. And so, in that regard, I think when people you know when people turn on certain music, I mean, obviously he named every title after a gang star song, which which are all classics in in a, in a sense. And also he you know employed uh, Adrian Young and Ali Shaheed Muhammad as uh, composers for the film, which gives it a certain feel and really makes it unique because what you're doing then is not, you're not buying uh, the suits off the rack. You're actually making a custom-made suit, and everyone knows that that's a better way to approach this. So we're, they customize the sound to fit the, the pieces. As they watch the, the series, they watch the episodes, and they tailor the sound for that to kind of, you know, just amplify what, what was already there on the screen. So uh, it, it's key. Um, I think when you add that to it, it's like icing on a really nice cake. So I don't, I don't want to, you know, I, I can't, we can't discredit the music at all. The music is a very essential part of this, uh, this production. Now, watching the show made me want to move to Harlem because it really kind of romanticizes the place <laughs> yeah. in a certain way. I mean, are you going to feel guilty? If Luke Cage helps contribute contribute to the gentrification of Harlem, because people see the show and go, I think we want to move there and buy a brownstone. You know, I, but I, here's the thing: I believe that you know I lived in Harlem for five years, and um, I visited. Obviously, we, we filmed there, and it, we did romanticize it a bit. Um, but in that regard, I feel like what people, the Harlem that we show, it's so black and inclusively black. 
while people would like to move there and to gentrify it and all the things that people want to do when they, when they, when they see the opportunity, that's fine and dandy, but the, the point of making it authentic and the point of making it Harlem is to have the color, to have people of, of color and ethnicity there, to have diversity there. It, it can't be just, you know, whitewashed, you know, and, and that's, that's something that, it, once you do that, that's not Harlem anymore. And I think the minute that happens, the appeal has, is, is gone as well. So I, I hope that, you know, like many places, many buildings in New York City, Harlem will be preserved because people will make it so and they will, you know, put, put forth the effort to make, make certain um, arrangements that we will always have the original Harlem. Well, the show is Luke Cage. It's on Netflix streaming right now. Mike Coulter, thanks for coming to the Wall Street Journal. Appreciate it. Thank you thanks. so much for having me.